Welcome everyone. I'm Jennifer Scapitone and I'm here to introduce the new Voices in Poetry reading. As we open this evening, I'd like to reinforce as a teacher of English and Romance languages here and as poet, scholar and host, the condition of being guest in this place and the commitment to supporting the actuality that we tune in from the ancestral and contemporary homelands of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, and of the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac, Fox, Kickapoo, and Illinois nations as well. That I speak from Chicago, toponym which is a French approximation of Chicaqua, the Miami, Illinois turn, for the wild garlic along the riverbanks emanating from Lake Michigama, a lake that Divya Victor identifies as lined with fur, red and mottled, laden with grain, exchanged for a pelt, bought for a kettle, swapped for a gun, brindled by blood. Such counterpositioning is germane to the introduction of our guest of honor, whom I'm so grateful to welcome this evening, however pixelatedly, a poet who has scored through hybrid works, the migration of diasporic communities, but also the violence of foisted settlement, of collective notions of destiny, of belonging inflicted and policed and the ruptures of these policed territorialisms by lushly seditious advents of kith over the course of her career. This evening is devoted to new voices in poetry and Divya has generously read from the work of our student body and selected Wahid al-Mamun to read alongside her and shine for the evening. Congratulations, Wahid. I'll continue introducing Divya after Wahid reads, and we'll invite her now to say a few words about Wahid's poetry. Thank you so much for lending your attention to our students' poems and for being with us, Divya. Jen, thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. Um, and Starsha says that she will be very much behind the scenes, but she has been so present in curating and organizing all of this. So I thank her as well. Um, it's a real privilege to introduce an emerging poet. Um, and indeed, I think it's this generation towards which I am writing, to whom I feel accountable, along with those elders who have taught us how to arrive at our own poetics. Wahid Al Mamun is a Singaporean poet currently majoring in anthropology with a minor in creative writing. Wahid's poetry is concerned with the intersections of family, migration, and intimacy. His mother, excuse me, his poem, My Mother Thinks I Dream in Bengali, received an honorable mention in Singlet Station's inaugural Hawker Prize for Southeast Asian Poetry in 2018. He has featured in writers' festivals in Singapore and Melbourne, and his works and translations have appeared in Cordite, Prata Journal, Quarterly Literary Review Singapore, and Food Republic. Notably, Wahid hates string cheese. I too hate string cheese. I am suspicious of its form, its acquiescence to tear and splinter, its strange comfort in being both water and rubber. But this isn't what drew me to Wahid's world. In his poem, Detritus, I read these lines. A country built on a landfill, a country this country, no, this my, nothing, this. Wahid's words buoyed me and caved me in at once. At once I recognized in it my own experience of growing up in Singapore, a country built by reclaiming the sea and also the slowly dawning horror that the maternal sum of a nation could never hold me could never be my own something because I too was only nothing to it. I was buoyed in my recognition of this condition and caved in by knowing that someone else shared this, this my nothing, this my nothing, this. I'll confess to stopping and stepping away, having to feel my way through the searing minimalism in Wahid's poem. And I'm glad I did because I would need to steady myself for what followed 
which was an impressive formal array in poems that shifted perspectives, modes, subgenres, that shifted tones kaleidoscopically, moved in and out of lyric realism and documentary reportage, exposing the seams and stuffing of a poetic approach turned inside out. I feel grateful for the work being done here in his poems to observe the effects of continuing forms of indenture and its shattering impacts on our ability, on our ability to dream, to even have a body, and to witness each other's intimacies. I see in his work the beautifully metabolized effects of the last three decades of gains made by translingual Asian diaspora poets who are comfortable navigating in currents both warm and freezing in triglossic contexts and in defiance of mandatory monolingualism in the United States. And I also see in it the assertive strokes of someone who will know how to swim in the narrow straits of the lyric and the wide daunting bay of the documentary, offering us language and noise for that which there are no words, no sound, no words, no sound. Please join me in welcoming Wahid Al Mamun. Thank you so much, uh, Divya, for those very, very, very effusive and kind words. Um, I was talking to Divya before today's event, and I mentioned, speaking to her point about generational um, commentary, that it felt like a very much of a full circle event today to have the honor of um, speaking and opening for Divya because I had actually seen her at a Singapore Writers Festival, um, I don't remember the year, I think eight or 10 years ago. And just at that point, even at that point being struck by how lyric could be um, inhabited in such a political way. And um, I was very struck by that. And it's an impulse that I'm trying to lean into always in all its ugliness and uh, anger and to stray away from romanticizing. Um, struggle and strife and leaning into its ugliness. So in that, um, on that note, um, I would like to read my piece to try this. I'm going to share my screen for this, actually. Um, and if people can see this, they can give a thumbs up. <laughs> All right. Okay. So here goes. Detritus. Um, trigger warning um, early on for violent imagery and allusions to suicide. One, yesterday, a tidal wave the size of an apartment building opened up beneath me and my sunken lungs started filling, slowly filling with things I once loved, things that housed me once in their soft mouths, the scratched up station wagon, a mother, round as a ball, a country built on a landfill, a country, this country, no, this, my, nothing, this. Two. At night, I dream of fish writhing in an icebox, their scales the color of rainbows, always the butcher, always the cleaver, gleaming with blood and moonlight, always I say, run, run, you stupid fish. What god took your legs away? The mute fish stare back, stupidly. The butcher swings, chucking the tails into a bucket, still squirming in schools of shit collapsing around their hollow spines. Icebox melts, bony rivulet that wets my shoes. Three, from a Channel News Asia article dated August 6, 2020. On July 24th, a 37-year-old Indian worker was found dead at 512 Old Trachikang Road. According to the police, this is a case of an unnatural death and investigations are ongoing. In May, a 27-year-old migrant worker from Bangladesh was found motionless at a factory converted dormitory in Kranji. A few weeks before that, a 46-year-old Indian national died from his injuries after being found motionless at a staircase landing at Kutikpot Hospital. Videos have also circulated online, with some showing workers standing precariously on rooftops and high ledges. One of these videos, posted sometime around July the 22nd, shows a worker standing on a ledge at PPT Lodge 1B dormitory in Sulitar. The worker, who was staying in a block that was cleared of COVID-19, had bought a flight ticket home on his own and became agitated when his employer was not facilitated of his return, MOM had said in a Facebook post. 
On August the 2nd, another worker had appeared to harm himself at his dormitory in Sungai Kadut. Photos circulating online show a man lying bloodied on a stairwell. Four. Other things found in the landfill. A row of hard hats. Yellow, yellow, wood, yellow, hanging on a corrugated door. A leaf from a winter tree, the color of three-day-old blood. Photo of a girl, not here. The film's border is a white tapeworm slowly eating her heels. Note that we all have loss impressed upon our thumbs. On the back, Avar Jimbon Chongoni, Tomar Adre Ami Bheshiachi. A crumpled shopping list. And what happens when you have to move the seas to live? You make lists, you check them off, and before you know it, you die. A voice, a mother's, mine, then another, then another. Then another, 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 iron beams stack on top of each another until they form a skyscraper, losing all sense of proportion, where the wooden voice used to sit a metallic whirring, a fading to vertigo. This is how you build something out of nothing. Five, the archive bears its teeth. Silver pile drivers huddled around a bloodied gorge, dumb stump where my tongue used to sit. Once upon a time before the butcher's swing, I had several languages for this anger. No more. Shab bhengeche. Dhangshir abusheshe bhasha kuchthahabe. All is broken. Watch me throw all my words up. Watch the bay turn green. Know that the seabed folds silt and sand into plenty. E shunar dam shunar ojandeyekin lam. The gold standard of nothing. Can flesh stand in for language? My hardened skin, my hollow spine, the archive makes you. You cannot stop it. Look, my jaw opens itself. Drop the nai, gonna drop the nai. Three, undead, unnatural, investigations, motionless, national injuries for motionless circle, standing precariously, block his own facilitative return, appeared, blood, one, Seven, how strange then to die in this icebox dream. Thank you. I'll pass the time over to Jen to introduce Divya again. Thank you so much, Wahid. That was absolutely stunning. And so was Divya's introduction. Divya Victor's collections of verse, lyric essay, and visual objects include Things to Do with Your Mouth from the Fig in 2015, Natural Subjects from Trembling Pillow in 2015, winner of the Bob Kaufman Prize, Kith from Fence and Book Thug 2017, and from Nightboat last year, Curb. These works concretize years of geolocating and carefully, sometimes carnivalesquely, redefining the strains of kith lost and forged, of the familiar bound by more than blood, while simultaneously delineating the churning of all skins, of all phenotypal otherness through a post-Patriot Act United States into a violent same a legal regime of nationalist gatekeeping subtended by dehumanizing paperwork dictating legibility, but also by the convenient ignorance of white supremacist territorialism on the ground along a continuum of microaggression and murder. We are our skins, we are our hides, but my skin and the skin of others like me has been torn. It is at the sight of this gash that our identity coheres, that our identity is a spied. So writes Divya Victor about the wounds inflicted by colonial capitalist and racist brutality, ranging from the apparently banal, the italicization of culture as other, the discomfort around pronunciation of a foreign name, to the resolutely carnal, the fall of a body coated as colored, as black or brown, to a curb. Working with documents, 
and on behalf of the undocumented, the extra documented, and the documented several times removed, Victor's work restores to a lyric genre that has, like nearly all settled urban, suburban, and extra urban sidewalk worlds, been largely privatized. The collective dream of ritual reparation, one relationship at a time, repairing the gash in the social fabric without obscuring it. As her collaboration with Aaron Kohick on the artist's book project Curb that gave rise to the 2021 paperback version attests itself a relationship rather than an object as Victor noted in our lunchtime conversation today attests. She has worked in more than linguistic genres and dimensions. She has been a Mark Diamond Research Fellow at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, a River Run Fellow at the Archive for New Poetry at UC San Diego, and a writer in residence at the Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions. Her work has been performed and installed at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, the National Gallery of Singapore, and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. She has also worked as an editor at Jacket 2 in the US, Ethos Books in Singapore, Invisible Publishing in Canada, and BookThug Press in Canada. She is currently Associate Professor of English at Michigan State University. Though we don't have copies as we normally would on the table in the back, I urge you to buy a copy of Curb noting that all royalties ascribed to the author from the sale of Curb will be donated equally to the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance and the South Asian American Digital Archive. We will place a link to the book in the chat. Please help me welcome warmly Divya Victor. Thank you, Jen. Thank you so much. I really cannot think of a better person to usher in my own body and my voice and my work today than Wahid. So thank you so much, Wahid, for your um, really um, striking, and as Josh Lamb said in the chat, gutting poem. Um, I really appreciate hearing you. And um, I really appreciate the choices you made formally to present us with that language um, as a kind of uh, multiple um, sensing of apparitions of language um, on the page. Thank you so much. And, and Jen, it's not fair, it's a very disarming introduction, um, but it also arms me and steadies me. So thank you. Um, I'm so, so glad to be here. Um, I've been reading from Curb for almost a year now on this tour of the book from my study. And it, it has been seen in, in reviews and, and in many contexts as a book about hate crimes against South Asian Americans and immigrants the violence of supremacy and the misrecognitions advanced by the state, the misrecognitions that put so many of us um, in our graves, and it is. But it's also a book about how we occupy space before we know who we are as girls and femmes, as mothers on the way of, you know, on their way to being split from their own bodies in birth as passengers temporarily held in the chassis of an Uber ride, navigating roads with someone who we see as Kith, someone who is a stranger who resembles someone you love. And while I have read mostly through this year from the curb, which is to say, looking outward and away, I want to read today from the stoop, looking inward, and into the younger years um, before I was so fully and obviously claimed by the state, um, but still had to navigate roads, sidewalks, public spaces that were not meant for me or those of us with smaller bodies or bodies made smaller by society. Um, waiting, those of us who were in our, in our smallness, waiting to be seen, but not yet snatched away into our terrible utility. So, so this is a way of saying this is a B-sides reading and B-sides really, um, <laughs> you know, they, they really are the scarier part of the album, <laughs> you know, for, for musicians. And it is definitely the scarier part of the book for me. 
Um, and these were the poems that needed more time to be unwrapped. So I'm especially grateful to Jen in the present and Bellamy Mitchell um, from a couple of years ago for creating the conditions at the University of Chicago for these poems to be unwrapped. Here we go. I'm going to read for about 30, 32 minutes. Hedges. This begins with an epigraph from Michel Serre. Through the skin, the world and the body touch, defining their common border edge. Contingency means mutual touching, our common tangency. First, there was a sea, and then there was a knot of hair. First, there was a line, and then there was a story. How do the dead wait in this tunnel, this tomb of book and breast? Patient. One, at the consulate, the line for birth certificates is the line for death certificates. Was the child born beyond a boundary? Was the boundary wrought in gunmetal and grain? When they pull her out, the trundle of my pelvis rattles but doesn't give way. In the prattle of the operating theater, she arrives like a slap backwards, fleeing the face, the palm indigo smarting from flight. Our shared border is a fist unfurling a red flag, her, a thing pink found in the maraud, taken as a peel is further and further from the fruit until plum descends to plumb, until a sound long and lean turns into a kind of skin, her, a thing inked, fleeced by charter. Were the parents held by the law FS240, did they love in the same language, DS1350? They first lift Sarosa from Sarosa, arouse all the roses, prick each thorn, hum sub rosa, a song known to someone born before you. Adi do, adi, adi, adi do. Aratu. To pleach a tree, we take the dead stem and braid it to a living branch until a hedge thickens, until the braids come undone and the schoolyard dusts the black hair red until at the hospital ward, my cries command the clouds to the window. Cumulus, alluvial, lunatic, each breath quests a gust, counts to five, makes a list for the names of God, Twin simoons strand us both at the tear, where earth parts from earth, zameen, our zikr, zikr, our partition, awaking to daylight assembly from one, many, e ovum pluribus, us, us, strung on suture, a flag drying, saffron, and egg white, and succulent on a clothesline, aloe, and organ. Saffron, an ovary. Patients water intact 48 hours later. They sweep the membrane of the water sack. They bring the sky broom to enter my stoop. They bring the blocks of ice. Yes, I feel that. Place them against my chest. Yes, I feel that. She is ready. Yes, I feel that. Unfold the shroud. Yes, I feel that. Staunch the incision. Yes, I feel that. And sign here. Adiru. Adi, 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 do. Adi, adi, three. Until I was 11, I slept inside my mother's passport. In that photograph, I wear the face which drank the wet moons, horns and all. I have the eyes of the deer crossing the Pacific, two stitches on a, a single stave, stitch, stitch. 
this will form a good scar. This will be a ring of, ring of roses, a pocket full of passport poses. Do you have proof of identity? She is her mother's child, as I am my mother's child, and she is her mother's. Arido. Ari, 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 ro, araru, ari, 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 ro. Hang the towels, beat the rugs, skim the way, swaddle the archipelagos. We are coming home with the bundled papers. We have fledged ourselves over this line paper cranes that we are in this bleach sky. This is the plot, as in, we now have a story, as in, I pricked it red, where you and I meet on a grid of wet, as in, I have made a notarized copy of all our feathers. After we moved back to the United States from Singapore, um, where my, our child was born, um, and Singapore is a country which was once mine, or as Wahid would say, which was my, my nothing, we returned to an unrecognizable United States under Trump, um, under the sign of virulent supremacy, which was new and old. But in the shock, I moved into a predominantly white neighborhood and began writing about my interactions with my neighbors while st standing on yards and at the edge of flower beds. And in these, you know, as you'd expect, the minor insults and the microaggressions began to add up. And I noticed that when they began to occur, I began to dissociate. And I started imagining or dreaming or sort of moving to spaces in my childhood um, especially in a town called Trichy in India, where my smaller body might have felt more present. And so the, the couple of poems I'm going to read now shunt between these two spaces, East Lansing, Michigan, and Trichy, India. And they locate us exactly at a lawn and a flower bed in both of these spaces. Lawn temperate. The block party has two types of sausages. She meets two Bills, two Susans, two Phils, two Marys. These sausages look so good, she is saying, but she hasn't tasted them. Bill, Susan, Phil, Mary have grandchildren named Bill, Susan, Phil, and Mary. They face her, head cocked. Olivia, Vivian, Vivia, Diva, Tibia. It's Tivia one offers this, that, she tries, she gestures towards the sausages. So good, she is saying. Her name is small talk here. It is inclement weather, a store going out of business, an ongoing sale at the end of a season. It is one time something happened and boy, was it something. She slips into the Midwestern apology, beer in hand. There you go, you almost got it. She is laughing the same laugh that she has heard her father laugh at so many all white office parties, cheering their attempts, playing surrogate to their embarrassment, comforting them into peace in their mouths where no tongue ever pressed against the teeth to create the sound of the soft D. The D of the, the D of the, the D of then, the D of therein, therefore, and these, where no eyes have gaped as teeth moved and tongue lolled to find horizon, where no eyes have looked for ships seeking safe harbor in that perfect rounded sound where no dock ever bobbed against that sweet thud of a velvet wavelet D, where no lip has ever parted to change the course for someone like me. So good, she is saying. Lawn, arid. Lawn of dust. We wash the kids on the yard stone so our names are cleansed of spit. Lawn of crow gather and cow paws. You pick up the rolled newspaper so our names arrive with the dawn. Lawn of barefoot hopscotch. 
you touch the stick to the ground so our names grow in the furrows. Lawn of snail trail silver. You pin the dragonfly wings on the barbs so our names are knotted with wire. Lawn of weed and bramble. You toss the tenacoit across the street so our names reach over our ears. Lawn of badminton at midday. You dry the feathers on the clothesline so our names take flight. Lawn of milk. You walk with an empty pail to the gate so our names are quenched. Lawn of alert marigolds. You burn the camphor on the stoop so our names are spelled in flames. Lawn of red dirt at dusk. You sprinkle sugar on buttered bread so our names are buried with yours. Beds, clay. We are on our knees. We are saying that the tulips have had it hard this week. We are saying something about the brightness and the dryness, and we're saying we hope it will change. I press a finger into the loam, flick the dust on my jeans. We are listening to the snip of shears. I pick up a smooth, small disc of pink Sioux quartz, hold it like an avian heart in the palm. A disc slipped and beating from a time when all of North America was under sea. My finger walks the buttery vein that passes the stone in two and then in four. Its edges are under siege, its end at the foot of suburban perennials. Do you have stones? Someone is asking me. Where you're from, do you have stones like these? We have purple sunbirds, I'm saying, and their hearts have four rooms, one for every answer to questions like these. Beds, red loam, for my father. In it, we clip it comics. Upper, our sheets, our sails. When those people came, they trapped the wind that leaves your body behind. So we find a piece of it land. In it, we clip it the postage stamps. Papa, our letters, our shirts. When those people came, they stripped the night that leaves your body behind. So we loosen the it soil. In it, we clip it the obituaries. Papa, our names are masks. When those people came, they carve out the eyes that leave your body behind. So we dig the it down. In it, we clip it the headlines. Nana, our rice is sand. When those people came, they filled the bowls that leave your body behind. So we peel back the it sod. In it, we clip it the coupons. Baba, our blood is water. When those people came, they drained the well that leaves your body behind. So we fill it with it sky. In it, we clip it the tongue. Abba, our cries are coos. When those people come, they will steal the sons who leave your body behind. There's a reason I waited all year to read these. This is hard. Um, I'll read from a garlanded series of poems um, that, that I wrote to document this, this feeling I used to have in Uber rides or taxi rides when I would travel for work. And as many of you know, many, many drivers and transport workers come from South Asia, from Pakistan, Kerala, Bangladesh, Punjab. And in these rides, um, which I used to often take for work, you know, these moments of feeling really alienated and disembodied, I would find that there was a kind of tenderness in our small talk and laughter, even delight when the drivers were fellow passengers or fellow passengers were from South Asia. And so I wondered what remains vast and oceanic 
in our small talk and what remains possible within this transactional relationship? What intimacies remain possible within this transactional relationship? So this is a piece called Milestones and I'll read a little bit from that. Um, this has an epigraph from Claudia Rankin. I'll just read it quickly. And from that space of loneliness, I can feel the cab driver watching me in his rear view mirror. Be happy you can't read white people's thoughts, I want to say to him. I smile into the rear view mirror instead. Why with such a nice smile are you trying to weep? He asks me as we pull into my building. And that's from Don't Let Me Be Lonely, and a really important book. Milestone one. We speak about your daughter. Your Uber has arrived. We ride, quiet, curious. There is an us forming. A shoreline serrates the seat. His daughter, he says, should marry, but his daughter, he says, wants to study. Yes, I say she is right, as I was right. And my father, what does he do? Does he live with me? No, I say, I would like him to, but he must work. That is how it is for girls, he says. And for us fathers too, for us too, it is like this only. The traffic quivers an amber frill on his brow. His mouth parts and all catches the water, drives a stroke through silence. For us too, for us too, for us too, for us too, for us too. What he wants to say and cannot is that my eyes are the color of shade, a dark oval left on the earth by a fig tree from his hometown seen in the rear view mirror where I see us pulling into the East Village next to the Ailanthus tree growing from a wall, its roots a delta spreading on red brick. Milestone two, we laugh about the weather, its permanence. 457 South Mariposa Avenue, Los Angeles, California. Your Uber has arrived. How are you today? Where are you from? Where are your parents from? How many years have you lived here? Do you like it here? Are you able to bear the winters? Are they good to you at work? Do you go back often? Is your family here? When will they come? How does your wife like the movies here? When will her papers be cleared? Are your parents in good health? How often do you see them? Do they like it there without you? Where is your landlord from? Have the flights become more expensive? When will the rains come this year? Will you be able to vote in that election? When will the dam developers come? When will your sister's wedding be? Will you be able to go for the wedding? When will you see your children? What is your daughter's name? How often do you have to send money home? When did they sell the buffalo? How often can you send the insulin kits? Has the cost of onions gone up again? When did your father pass away? When will they sell the farm? How soon will the wells dry up? When did your mother stop sleeping? Um, Gaston Bachelard writes that memories are motionless and the more securely they are fixed in space, the sounder they are. He writes that for a knowledge of intimacy, localization 
in the spaces of our intimacy is more urgent than the determination of dates or time. So I'll read two poems about walking and movement and movement in my memory. Um, and they're about walking sidewalks as a young girl, one alone and one with company. First alone and then with company. En plein air. If on a day after the rains, you go to the tamarind tree at the edge of the tar road, you will find a man covered in chalk and white as fog, sitting on the highest branch, courting crows and cawing to the clouds. And if you go to the tamarind tree at the edge of the tar road, and you find a man covered in chalk and white as fog, sitting on the highest branch, courting crows and cawing to the clouds on a day after the rains, and if he sees you with his pumice eyes, and if he flaps you forward with his flim flam arm, and you with your ink stained palms trip into the dust, and if you take off your sandals and plop down your bag, and if you look at the pock dirt where the pods have dropped, and if you pick up a smooth tamarind seed hot and marooned like a shear of liver from a lost body and if you slip it into your pocket and if on a day after the rains this chalk man flops his limbs down and they creep down the branches and if you at the edge of the tar road itch at your red feet and tug on a scab and if when you aren't looking the chalk man on a day after the rains in the whitest of quiet drops his limbs down and creeps down the branches and pulls at your pinafore. And if you, having walked off the tar road and into the dust, having taken off your sandals and having plopped down your bag, having looked away from the pock dirt, rubbing your ink-stained palms, look straight at his milk-skin face when he, courting crows and cawing to the clouds, sees you with his pumice eyes, then you, knowing how long your hands have been stained by ink, knowing how long you've expected this man in the whitest of quiet, dig a well in the ground and you ink, ink, ink from the ground and you fill that well with ink and then you write. On a day after the rains, when I went to the tamarind tree at the edge of the tar road, I found a man covered in chalk and white as fog, sitting on the highest branch, courting crows and cawing to the clouds and waiting for me. And I, having taken off my sandals, held him by his limbs of fog, pulled him down from the highest branch, and I drowned him in the well of ink that I dug with my small hands. And this is the last poem I read. And I chose these because they're dedicated to my friend Briga Sethi and Shubram Gopinath, who I met in Singapore. So I chose this because I'm reading today with Vahid. Abba Ada. We walk a pair past eucalyptus trees, the sentries flock off the peach in the sky, frame the street smelling of crochet. They dim the pink, usher us to the open air theater where everywhere this summer they will screen 12 rapes. One for each week we are out of uniform, one for each cheap peppermint, one for each soda clear as rose water, dense as glass. We walk a pair, slip on socks fogged in red dust, orbiting what was once stone as dogs do dogs, hands the hips, and we walk the anywhere walks. Our first fuck-offs slip out the edges of our anywhere mouths, tasting flint and silt, tasting the selvage between two girls sewn into the landscape, spliced as we are to cellulose, camphor, fiction, Strip over strip, we rate ourselves you for unrestricted public exhibition. Our talk sprawls across the street. We are drifting into dusk in skirts. 
A ruffle too close, a downy arm far, far too far, past the single serve everythings, just this once's, past the grotto frothing hibiscus over the virgin's cape. Past velvet apostles overdressed for this emergency, each halo a hymen between man and his god. We talk fast, fast, too fast, into each other, pull words like shell after wet shell from the backswash. We draw ourselves in our own image in fast forward, the sillage of the ocean dragging itself back from us girls, girls, girls. We talk and we loiter all summer, annexed into every garden we grazed, called rose, 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 clasp coins into purses, pocket all the curses, one for each time we touch ourselves, for each time we speak of how laps dissolve, how a scene cuts, how a mountain range marks a cusp where one nation plunges into another. We just walk as girls do. Book bags grinding into the small of our backs. We talk to patch the shredded blouses. We cork the gut to melt in fear of salt or glance. We take it in our stride. We count to 12. For each time a sari is unreeled on screen from an anchor and beached near the navel, where the storyboard begins, pleats itself, then ends. We saunter into the grass cooling the shape of us under a kite scoot. We pierce apertures into our anywhere feet, stud our knowing to the law of sallow. We count fireflies, soft, soft, lit, lit. Envy their bellies blinking cold light. Wait for ours to project us, 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 us. The projector beam, a stream of wan albumen quivers all night. We sit, letting history catch up. But we have oiled our braids well to slip out of traps laid for us since we've known that roads never go where roads claim to go. Since we've known how to hopscotch, how to follow the mild marble into mud, how to wait to cross over until the hard-boiled sweet cracks mid-sentence like a frame in two. Thank you everybody for listening. That was so gorgeous. Um, just everyone clap. <laughs> I wish we could hear all, the, all of the applause after that literally lyrical, almost lullabying at times, literally lullabying at times reading. I feel really lucky to have heard your b-sides. It sounds like you haven't read from them. It's, I think it's funny to call them b-sides. Um, because they seem just as much A-sides to me. Um, what I'm going to do is to invite people um, because Divya um, and Wahid have been kind enough to you know, um, entertain questions um, for you all to maybe think of a question you might like to ask. We'll have about 15 or 20 minutes for that. And you can either raise your hand or put something into the chat. Maybe uh, because it does take people a while to, um, you know, collect questioning thoughts after a hypnotic reading such as that one, borrowing a term from the chat. Um, uh, I'm going to let Divya get a drink of water. <laughs> and I uh, do have, I mean, I have various questions. I can start us all off um, with a question and then um, I'll try to keep track and keep a queue of questions. Um, and yeah, so if you have a question, I'm going to put the Night Boat Books um, link into the chat. Uh, there's also a link to 
um, buying it at our beloved seminary co-op above from Starsha. So um, Divya, um, because you just read this particular group of poems and because I had the lucky chance to teach this not only in a course devoted to poetry and the present moment where we're thinking about how you engage you know, the news and um, immediate, immediate pressing socio-political circumstances, but also in a course devoted to eco-poetics, I actually really thought a lot about the works that you just read from. And um, so in thinking about your, your um, citing Bachelard on the spatialization of memory, I would like to ask you about I think you use the word graft or duct or something very, you know, kind of um, carnal and botanical to speak about the dual landscape of these, um, some of these poems. And it just struck me how um, vivid and alive the landscape of memory was in, these poems and we discussed in class the sort of US pastoral as a policed curbed measured lawned phenomenon versus the 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 flower bed um, you know and and also something much more um, sprawling and rhizomatic like the um, Ailanthus tree that appears in the East Village and the fig tree that the Uber driver sees in your eye. So just it's um, a general invitation for you to talk about um, landscape and memory and placement and displacement um, in this work. I feel like this is a whole dinner and a whole event in itself in some ways, but I appreciate the occasion to talk about that, Jen. Um, the fig tree, the ailanthus tree, the camphor weeds. Um, there's, so, there's so many ecological traces in this book. Um, when I began to write the second uh, version, the sort of extended version of Curb, the very first thing I did was I took a one of those old fashioned um, clipboards with some paper on it. And I walked my neighborhood with like a bunch of plant identification apps. And I, I tried to map the neighborhood um, through the plants that were used for primarily ornamental purposes by my predominantly white neighbors. And I was very curious as somebody who had never had a garden because I'd never had a garden because I was always a migrant. And this is the first time I've started thinking of myself as someone to use a very, I think, South Asian phrase, someone who settles down um, with, with all the implications of, of becoming a settler in that sense. And I wanted to understand what is it that draws people to having gardens and what, how is that connected to identity? And that, that mapping took me into an understanding that we crave a continuation in our ornamental gardens of uh, the vestiges of colonial occupation in the Southeast and in South Asia, because, you know, even my coleus, right? It comes, you know, from what used to be called Java. And so the, this impression that we were constantly trying to overlay on mid Midwestern soil, um, the, vest the ecological vestiges of uh, a colonial past, even while we remained in the very, ongoing colonial present. So like temporally, that also really was a very disorienting feeling for me. Um, so that's where it began, began for me as a process. And then came the force of nostalgia for landscape. And so another way to think about Curve is that it's a book about landscapes and portraits um, and to imagine where they intersect. So how are people um, built off the environment and how do they come to resemble the environments um, that built them. So Ada and Arba, for example, this, this idea that the fact of walking and being seen and, and being treated as a sexual object as a 10-year-old or 11-year-old child, um, 
being called a rose when you're little, for example, um, shapes us in a certain way or grows us in a certain way um, and forces a kind of acquiescence to being um, groomed um, a certain way. You know, th it feels horticultural to me. M my gender feels like <laughs> something that has been cultivated in that sense. Um, so there's that. And, and, and nostalgia came up because I, I just, I really missed Trichy and I missed the red dirt. And I wanted to understand what mineral formations and what geological history created the kind of red dust that would just caught me at the end of a school day. I would just be so dusty and I missed that. Um, you know, like washing, washing up before going for my music lessons was this ritual of like being reborn from the environment again. You know, but that's a geological, um, like that's me moving geological evidence from my flesh. So, you know, so it's, it's about nostalgia and it is of course about trying to understand the colonial trace of gardening here. So that's, it's a, I hope that helps. Does that answer your question, Jim? Yes, it's just, as you say, the beginning of a dinner that I really wish that we were having right now <laughs> about geology and the plantation and so on. Um, so thank you. Um, Alessandro Minucci has asked um, about your models for the book. Um, so for instance, he sees a relationship with Norbese Phillips Zong but wonders if maybe he is wrong. <laughs> um, so maybe not just Norbese Philip, but um, others that you might want to talk about as models. Norbese is very important to my work. Um, her book, She Tries Her Tongue, um, was like, I has a very special place in my life as a poet. I didn't know I could be who I am in some ways until I read that book. And Myung Mi Kim's work, um, The Bounty and Dura and Underflag were very important. Um, Theresa Hakim Cha's Dicte, very important for me. Um, Doug Kearney's entire oof. And I cannot think about the ecological as a shaping force in our subjectivity without thinking about C.A. Conrad whose entire oeuvre is really important to me. And, and CA was one of the first poets I met in the United States who said to me, like, I, I think you're onto something. And I was like, yeah, nah. And, he, and they were like, nah, for real. I mean, talk about conversations on the stoop, Jen, as we were discussing, that was determining. Um, I'm very influenced also by the sort of um, historicist, materialist gorgeousness of Patty McCarthy's work. I think more people should read her. Um, the way she's able to use historical documents as um, always present shaping tools for our subjectivity, very important for me. Um, yeah, those are the first books that come to mind. Um, Alessandro, and I think you're right that Norbesi is an influence, absolutely. Not so much Zong, I would say, in terms of um, the processes of the text in Zong, but absolutely the, the sense of bearing witness to, for and with the dead and the kinds of moral obligations that come with that and the ethical considerations for form that come with that. Um, she has been a very important elder, yeah. Thank you so much. And we just read CA's or Amanda Paradise's Resurrect Extinct Vibration last week in um, Eco Poetics. So that's um, a wonderful link for my students. Um, I would like to just invite people to either um, raise their hands or write into the chat. Um, so Shivani, um, Shukla, uh, um, says the word and color red is a repeated presence in the poems and makes the imagery somehow more poignant. You've begun to d discuss this, but could you talk about the thoughts behind the inclusion of redness? And uh, Shivani's mother is also named yeah it's true that's wonderful hi to your mom shivani 
Um, and I'm so glad someone's paying attention to the palette of Cub. Um, red is very present. The specific color of marigold, um, sort of the Aztec gold marigold in particular is really present because it resembles turmeric. And also indigo is very present to me. And um, I think I write somewhere in Curb that indigo is, is a color that really does bring me to my knees. I'm, and I only later discovered um, it's the history of its you know, export from India. And also the long history of indigo treatment here um, by indigenous craftsmen and women um, as well. But of course, it's the color of ink. Um, red because vermilion. And it is really difficult for me as an Indian to avoid vermilion. Um, it was the color of waking up for my mother. Like I would know the day would, be, would begin because she would wear vermilion on her forehead. And even though uh, we are not Hindu and I'm an atheist and my family is Catholic, there is still um, this kind of we, we still carry the symbol of the seed on the forehead or in the body through the, to the wearing of puttu or vermilion. And I think the ritual uses of vermilion as, um, as this thing that's been drawn from the earth as pigment to mark our bodies um, was for me the earliest sense of like the body as an inscribable surface, like you're a kid and then suddenly here's this dot and you're not a kid anymore. So that's, that's writing, right? That is a certain way of making your body legible or controlling a certain kind of legibility on your body. Um, so when I think about red, I think vermilion, I think the body as an ins inscribable surface. Um, and of course, blood, which is important to cope and kit. <laughs> Thanks, Shivani, for the question. Wow, that answer, like your other answer, <laughs> This speaks both nostalgia, but also control at the same time, control of girls and women's bodies in a way that I didn't really mention when I was introducing you, all, because it's a whole other thing, right? Um, it's, um, it's something very important that runs throughout your entire work, the idea of somewhere that arises maybe in Kith of being sliced up and served as at your wedding <laughs> um <laughs> this um very you know carnal and there there are these carnal chaucer-esque moments in the poems but they can always turn on a dime into the violence against women um or at least yeah control of and potential violence against women Right, right. And the question is always, how do you not come to hate the body that has served patriarchy without your consent? <laughs> how, do, how do you do that? Um, in, and in language, and how, how can language help you not do that? That is a question for the ages. <laughs> um, so we are nearing the end of our time. I'm going to give people another minute here to um to um maybe uh, uh launch a question but i really think that with that question which i want to now like write down and put on my wall um okay. i i would feel comfortable um bringing this conversation and gorgeous um dual reading to a close thanking you both so much Divya Wahid and also Starsha Gill behind the scenes. Um, yes, I think that we bid good night to everyone and thanks so much for coming. Um, I have, um, I hope that the live transcript will allow me to think further on these questions um, for a while. Okay, and thank, thank you, Erin, for um, the gorgeous presentation on the Artist's Book Curb. Oh yes, one thing I want to say is that the Artist's Book um, Curb is in our special collections at the University of Chicago. 
because of COVID rules, you need to make an appointment to view it, but it's really a special thing that we have one of these, I believe it's one of 20 in circulation beyond the copies that were reserved for the actual makers of the book. So please check it out. Um, our students were, were there and um, perusing it over a collective dining table um, in the library this afternoon. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye, Curb. <laughs> seminary Co-op. Support the Seminary Co-op and support Nightboat Books. Thank you.